we will try to keep them muted. So during today's session, we are going to focus on specifically on um, the wash fit tool and the methodology. And then Maggie from WHO will also give a short presentation specifically focusing in on uh, water requirements. And this is just one of the series of technical modules that we have which accompany the wash fit package. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that wash fit, what is included in that wash fit package in due course. So <clears throat> in today's session, we are going to go very briefly over the wash fit tool. Um, this is, of course, a very short online training webinar session. And we have, we are doing this in place of a four day more extensive training of trainers. So of course, this is really just going to be a quick flavor and overview of the tool. And we hope it will be the beginning of a bigger conversation and um, useful preparation for when the training does eventually go ahead. Um, and we'll be keeping you posted uh, on when that might be according to how things develop with the current global situation. So today, it's, as I said, a flavor of WashFit. So by the end of today's session, we hope that you should all know what WashFit is and where it should be used and begin to start thinking about how you can start to adapt it and use it in your own country. And we remain um, available to provide more technical assistance and potentially to organize some further online webinars, uh, maybe on a country by by country basis, if that would be helpful to you. Um, so please do start thinking about how this can be used in your own setting. We'll also talk a bit about how we're going to, how to assess and improve specific technical domains. And as I said, Maggie will um, give us a presentation specifically on water today. Um, and we are looking into running a series of webinars where we have one session for each of the technical domains. Um, and that would take place in the coming months. So please stay tuned for that as well. So on to what, on to what fit and what it is and what it covers. So many of you on the call may have already had some experience of using the tool um, or have attended sessions where it's been talked about. Um, so you, some of this may be familiar to you all already, but we are at, in the process of going through some revisions to the tool. So some things uh, may be slightly different from what you have, um, what you're familiar with already. So what is WashFit? Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the water safety planning approach, it's um, a similar approach. So it's a risk-based um, methodology for assessing and improving uh, water sanitation hygiene, healthcare waste services in healthcare facilities. So it, it's built on the water safety plan methodology using that five-step approach. And we'll come to, to go through those steps um, in detail uh, in due course. Um, it's in order for facilities to identify areas themselves for improvement and importantly for them to take action. Um, it's a stepwise approach, so the idea of making incremental changes uh, in order to make longer term um, improvements to a healthcare facility with the ultimate aim of improving quality of care. So that's the goal that we need to keep in mind quality of care at the end. What is WashFit not? So it's not a tool for national level monitoring. And this is something which I think often confuses WashFit users. And people talk about, oh, we, we want to do an assessment, we're going to use WashFit, and that's the end of it. But WashFit is really about taking action, not just about doing assessments for assessment sake. Of course, the information that's collected um, through the process of WashFit can produce useful data, which can be used. Um, by governments, local governments, to, to assess what's going on in healthcare facilities and how they're improving over time. But I want us to get away from thinking about it just as a monitoring tool. It's also not going to be the same everywhere it's used. And um, we'll hear a few examples of where WashFit has been used so far. Um, but it's been used so far in over 25 countries uh, with different focuses. Um, in different settings, so in cholera hotspots, to emergency settings in um, Cox's Bazaar, to uh, improving maternal and child health in a specific ward in um, Tajikistan, to from very small facilities in Central Africa to bigger facilities elsewhere. So it can be really used and adapted in different settings. 
and we'll also talk a bit more about how that adaptation process works. So how does WASH fit, fit into the practical steps? We touched on this yesterday and this question came up a couple of times in the chat box. So I just wanted to, to make sure that we began with, with a framing of, of where it fits. So there are the eight practical steps. And um, you may notice, of course, there's no specific wash fit practical step. And that's because wash fit is just one approach of many. We don't, um, as WHO and UNICEF, want to be completely prescriptive and say you must use wash fit. If there's another approach that a country is using that has been shown to work, then by all means continue to use that tool. So that's why you don't see wash fit specifically on the named in the practical step. But what fit is really linked to all of the practical steps are linked to the, way to, the uh, to the practical steps. So steps one, two, and three are about the national level preparation and creating an enabling environment. So those are the activities that you need to do before beginning what fit. So undertake a situation analysis. What is the situation in the country? What is the situation in healthcare facilities? What are the policies and um, strategies and guidelines that exist to help um, work on improving Washington healthcare facilities, IPC, AMR? And as mentioned yesterday, we have got some guidance about if you're interested in conducting a national situation analysis, how you would, how you would do that. The second one, uh, setting targets and defining a roadmap. So once you've got the baseline data to know where what the situation is in a country or in a region or a sub a district. Where do you want to get to in five years? Where do you want to get to in 10 years? And WASHFIT is a tool to help facilities move ahead and make improvements. So that is, is how it links to number two. Step practical three on established national standards and accountability mechanisms. So WASHFIT is a tool to help facilities reach their national standards. Um, and if the national standards don't exist, then it could be to, to work towards global standards. But we, of course, hope that countries have got standards in place or are in the process of developing them and can use WASHFIT in order to meet those standards. <clears throat> in some countries, um, WASHFIT is actually referenced specifically in the guidelines <laughs> for <the> national standards <laughs> used to meet, meet those standards. So I know Madagascar, for example, is one, one such example. So those are the national level um, practical steps, if you like. And then coming to the facility level implementation of WASHFIT. So WASHFIT is partly about improving infrastructure and maintenance. And through assessing the indicators and going through that risk improvement plan, it will help facilities to uh, take step-by-step -step, uh, step -step, uh, improvements to ultimately have uh, more climate-friendly, climate-resilient, um, better uh, operated and maintained infrastructure. Also, it's about developing the health workforce. So there are certain indicators within WASHFIT which specifically look at training, which look at um, occupational health, uh, vaccinations for, for the workforce, um, rewards, and uh, continuing professional development of staff. So there are specific indicators within WASHFIT which link to number six. On number seven, engage communities. So communities have an important role to play in a healthcare facility. They're the ones that can demand change that can uh, help drive this process. And so it's recommended, for example, to involve a community member uh, or somebody from a, a community um, committee on the WASHFIT team. And then the last one, uh, number five and number eight, is really about documenting what works. So. Um, what, how WASHFIT has been used, what have, what have the successes been, what have been the challenges, and sharing that experience between, between countries. And we have started already documenting some case studies of WASHFIT, but we hope to, um, in the next few months, document more of specific experience from countries on how they have used the tool and where it's shown to be successful. And then on monitor and review data, so that's collecting routine data about WASH services in healthcare facilities. And as I mentioned before, though WASHFIT is not a national level monitoring tool, it can be helpful to collect information about the status of WASH services in healthcare facilities and then aggregate that information and share it 
uh, to the it, to the um, national level. Okay, so I, I mentioned as well that we are currently updating um, the, the training package on WashFit. So I just wanted to highlight some the timeline and specific updates that we are undertaking at the moment. So WashFit was originally developed in 2015. And as I mentioned, it's been implemented in over 25 countries now in every region of the world. And from the experience that we've that we've had from countries so far, we have had some feedback about how it could be better um, improved. So we are revising the WashFit guide with the aim of publishing a draft version um, in the middle of this year, approximately in June. Um, and that will provide greater focus on climate, um, on how facilities can work towards safe managed sanitation, more on environmental cleaning. So the CDC had come out uh, at the end of last year with the new um, guidelines for environmental cleaning, and also better guidance on how to adapt wash fit to different facilities. We want it to be more practical. So, what are the simple, sustainable improvements that facilities can make? We're also revising the training package, and um, the, they were due to be tested, if you like, for the first time this week in Bangladesh, but obviously we didn't have that, that opportunity. So we will be putting those online on the Washington Healthcare Facilities Knowledge Portal um, in the next week or so. So stay tuned for those uh, for those modules, and we hope that they will be a useful, uh, practical resource that you can all take and adapt for your own uh, settings. <clears throat> okay, just this here um, is a bit of a, a schematic about what uh, the overall objectives and the um, purpose of WashFit is. So, WashFit um, is, as I mentioned, the overall ambition is to improve quality of care. So, on the right hand side, you see the those immediate and long term impacts that we're working towards. So, um, Dignified and safe pregnancy and uh, delivery and postpartum care, improved health outcomes and lower maternal mortality rates. Yesterday, Maggie presented um, some of the data showing how um, delivery rooms are often the one with the, the least well served um, services, uh, particularly minimal infection prevention control um, facilities. So, one of the aspects, the aspects of Wash Fit is to perhaps focus in on uh, maternity delivery settings to improve quality of care there. Um, also, the last one I think at the moment is particularly critical in the time of coronavirus. So, to have improved outbreak response and resilience to those outbreaks. And coronavirus has shown us that. But in terms of wash, it's nothing different to what we should be doing already. So all these principles that we're talking about here, all these technical requirements, the same, all of those still apply to coronavirus. So uh, implementing wash fit to strengthen quality of care, improve infrastructure, uh, make it more resilient will only be beneficial in the long run. So what does wash fit cover within a healthcare facility? Well, it's quite broad, um, so we're talking about the whole range of uh, wash services. So everything from water, and that's water supply, water storage, quality testing, treatment. Um, it involves, we're talking about hand hygiene, so having the services available, having um, regular training for healthcare professionals and compliance monitoring. Uh, Look at health workforce, so training, occupational health, environmental cleaning and disinfection, healthcare waste management, and that's all of these stages. So from waste generation and segregation to waste reduction, recycling, treatment, all the way to final disposal. We're also looking at energy, so the energy that facilities require for lighting, for pumping, for heating, and then um, the, the softer side. Management, uh, problem reporting, um, SOPs, and those uh, elements that can't, that not infrastructure, the ones that can't be, um, can't be seen. Okay. 
Also, of course, sanitation is particularly important. So all the way from toilets, making sure that toilets are um, accessible, that there's sufficient numbers of toilets, that they're well, that they're well maintained and functioning. But also um, thinking as, as well about um, treatment and disposal of um, wastewater, grey water. So going beyond just the, to the physical toilets themselves. There's also elements um, that are covered under the WHO um, essential environmental health standards, so the green book that we refer to, um, ventilation, laundry, kitchen, control, so other elements that fall maybe outside the typical water sanitation. And then importantly, uh, climate resilience, reliable energy access, and environmental sustainability. So we heard yesterday from Carlos and Elena um, about the climate uh, resilient framework and um, many of those elements are now being integrated into the wash plate process. So on to the methodology and um, I mentioned already that uh, wash fit is based on the water safety plan methodology which is this which is a cyclical process where um, you start at fit number one and then you continue through to number five and then start again from the beginning so it's not something that can be completed as a one-off exercise but it's an ongoing process uh, that facilities can take and uh, integrate into their into their facility management and ways of working. So as I go through here, we're going to start at step number two, and then we'll come back and finish at step number one. So um, don't think that we've um, forgotten step number one. I'm conscious that I'm I'm also going through fairly quickly. So as a reminder, please do. Um, write any questions in the chat box if there are things that I've mentioned that aren't clear or elements that you like me to come back to um, or any other um, any other uh, comments. Okay, so step number, we'll start with step number two, conducting the facility assessment. So the, the facility assessment really forms the basis of wash fit. So understanding what the situation is in a healthcare facility, it's of course necessary for the facility to know what needs to be done and what improvements are needed. So for step number two, before beginning, it's important to prepare. So looking at the assessment form, adapting it to specific needs within the facility, and I'll show a slide um, in due course about how you can specifically adapt the assessment form in a given setting. Okay, then conduct the assessment, Review the results as a team. Calculate your wash fit score. So how overall do all these indicators combine to, to get um, a, a percentage score? Visualizing the data. So showing the data in a number of ways, but uh, as, a, as a way for facilities to understand where they are and where they need to get to. And then importantly, sharing the results with the district health office or other stakeholders who may be supporting that. So how do we do the facility assessment? So the assessment covers all of those areas that I previously mentioned. So from water to sanitation, through to energy, occupational health, um, greening, et cetera. There are in total, I think, about, at the moment, I think we have about 70 indicators, which sounds like a lot, but please don't let that overwhelm you because as I mentioned, there's ways of simplifying and having um, reducing the number for smaller facilities, and I'll come back to that shortly. The indicators were all based on the WHO Essential Environmental Health Standards. As I mentioned, those are the global indicators, and it's up to countries to adapt the indicator to the indicators to, to meet their own national standards. Each indicator has three levels uh, of to score against. So the highest level is if an indicator meets the minimum standard, uh, and therefore it scores two, or it's the green level. Uh, the middle level is if it meets some, but not all of the standards, which means that something needs minor improvement and should score one. 
or it doesn't meet the standards at all, and therefore it will need major improvement and it gets a score of zero. There's one example at the bottom of the screen there. The indicator is that waste is correctly segregated at all waste generation points. The highest level is yes, all waste is correctly segregated at all waste generation points. Uh, if there's some sorting, but not all done correctly, or it's not practiced throughout the facility, then the, then the indicator would score one. And if waste is not correctly sorted and segregated at any waste generation point, then it would score zero. And so all of the indicators follow that same pattern. Here's a snapshot of what the indicator assessment looks like. And this is currently under development. We're revising this at the moment, and we'll have a new version to share with you all um, soon. But it will, it will continue to follow this same broad pattern. The domains, um, the indicator assessment is categorized into the following domains, so water, sanitation, anti-hygiene and cleaning, healthcare waste, one section on energy and the environment, and then one on management and workforce. But climate specific indicators to ensure that facilities become more climate resilient are integrated throughout each of those domains. Here's a slide from the, the, the longer training package, and I won't go into uh, lots of detail here. This shows different pictures from healthcare facilities and it's just designed to get you thinking about what sort of information you need to collect. So in that first picture with the, the waste bins, um, it's about looking, not just saying, okay, yes, there's three bins, but opening up the bins, checking to see whether the waste is correctly segregated. Who are the people responsible for emptying those bins? Are they lined? Are there um, uh, pictures or an indication of how the waste should be segregated. Um, the second picture there, looking at a water supply, this is a picture from Mali in West Africa. And just to, to get you thinking about all the different elements that need to come together. So not just thinking, okay, yes, there's a tap there, there must be water, but is the water correctly treated? Is it routinely treated? Or is there action taken if the water is of insufficient quality? And there are indicators um, throughout the assessment form, which help to structure those um, that analysis of all the um, different aspects within the healthcare facility. Okay, so, how would you adapt the assessment tool? I mentioned already that you might want to adapt it to match the national standards. So, for example, it might be um, the requirement of number of toilets. Um, uh, or the ratio of people or patients to toilets. In the global standards for inpatients, that's 1 to 20. But perhaps in your country, it's 1 to 10 or 1 to 30. So you would want to uh, change the criteria in the assessment tool in order to match your national standards. Perhaps there are some questions um, which are of interest uh, in a given facility or in a country that aren't included. Uh, so you could add additional indicators. Or maybe the criteria that are listed in those traffic light systems um, are not ambitious enough. So maybe you want to add in higher um, criteria to reflect higher service levels. I said already that there were um, quite a number of indicators, and many of those indicators won't be applicable to very small healthcare facilities. So, for example, in a rural healthcare facility um, where you don't have inpatients or you're not doing delivery, some of those indicators won't be applicable. For example, are there mosquito nets on the inpatient bed or the number, the toilet ratio for inpatients? So those can be removed and they don't need to be included in the assessment. The assessment tool could also be adapted for a specific department or award. So rather than looking at the indicators over the whole facility, you might want to focus in just on one uh, particular department of interest. In Tajikistan, in Central Asia, they were using WashFit in their national hospital, and they decided to focus just on the paternity and delivery ward. So they were only interested in that um, 
part of a facility and therefore they only took the indicators which were of direct relevance to that ward. Or perhaps you want to focus on a specific domain. So um, in Laos, for example, when they first used WashFit, healthcare waste was a real problem. So they only were looking at the healthcare waste section of the assessment tool. And once they had got skilled with using the assessment tool and they were beginning to make improvements, they then started looking and assessing the other areas and the other domains uh, when they felt that they were um, competent and confident to use the tool. There are many ways to adapt to the tool and I think we'll hear um, intervention from our Subit Show colleague in the Philippines about how they have adapted the tool for their context. Um, so we'll hear from Bonnie uh, shortly. Okay, so then the WashFit score, you've done your assessment, so you want to know how well your facility is doing. And this is very useful to track progress over time in a facility and to make comparisons perhaps between facilities. So depending on how many indicators you have been, uh, you decided to assess, that would be your denominator. So taking um, the number of indicators and timesing it by two, because each indicator can score a maximum of two points. Um, and then the numerator is the total of all the scores generated across the area of interest. So either the, the domain, so a domain is water or sanitation, or the total of scores in that ward, or for the whole facility. And then you may want to apply a cutoff point um, for your overall score. So the criteria listed below are what were used um, by facilities in Liberia. So anything below two thirds was considered to be red, 67 to 75% considered yellow, and over 75% was green or, or well performing. But again, you could adapt those cutoff points to your own uh, needs or own situation. Okay. So here's just an example, um, to put it into context. This is an example from a hypothetical primary healthcare facility. It's small, it has no inpatients. Um, and so only 30 indicators were assessed because there's only two staff members and they only wanted, they only felt able to deal with a small number of indicators at the beginning. So their denominator, their maximum score was 30 times two was 60. They had 17 indicators which uh, met the standards and were green. They had seven that partially met and six that did not meet. So the total that they scored was 68%, which in their case was, uh, was considered to be um, in the yellow category. So obviously, much room for improvement to try and get it into the, the green or well performing. I should also mention that, of course, if a facility is scoring above 75% and is considered in the, the top performing category, if you like, that doesn't mean that you can say you're done, wash fit is finished. Without regular operation and maintenance, that score will very easily fall back and go into the yellow or even the red category. So we still need to think about ongoing operation and maintenance in this situation. Here's an example to show you from Kenya, where they, this is actually from 16 different district hospitals. So you see H1 to H16 at the bottom. And they wanted to do a comparison to see how the different facilities were comparing uh, against each other. And they did a data visualization according to the domain that they were assessing. You see that the water section at the bottom is was the best performing, there's the highest quantity of green at the bottom. And this is a very helpful way for, uh, for the government or policymakers maybe to compare facility performance, but it also can drive interest and consistent, consistent performance uh, by healthcare facility staff. If they see that perhaps they're not performing as well as other local hospitals, they may think about um, and making more improvements that may encourage and incentivize them to do so. Okay, so we've done our assessment, and of course, that's just the, the beginning. What we really want to think about is what are we going to do once we've got this, once we've identified the problem. So you've completed your assessment, and you need to review your results to see what are the major problems you've identified, what risks do these problems pose? So are there risks to patients? 
to staff? Is it a risk to the community? It might be risks about infection, or it might be risks, say, needle stick injuries, or it might be um, to do with uh, staff morale and performance or the dignity of patients, particularly vulnerable patients. Also importantly, thinking about what positive things the, the facility, uh, should the facility celebrate? What, what are they doing well and should be congratulated? We don't always just want to be thinking about the negative situation, but try and reward um, good um, progress where it where it um, balanced. Okay. I won't spend too long here on this picture. If we were all together in a room, we would have uh, an exercise where we would um, talk amongst ourselves and come up with some suggestions about uh, things that could be done in this situation in this maternity room. But um, I'm sure you can all see from here that there are a number of problems uh, that could be identified and a number of risks, uh, both to patients and to staff um, as well. So um, I want to start thinking about, when we talk about improvements, we're not just talking about expensive infrastructure improvements, but we're also thinking about low cost, uh, practical solutions that can be done um, immediately and will have a big impact. So here there's um, obviously some general uh, cleaning and tidying that needs to be done, uh, some minor improvements to taps, fixing leaking taps, um, cleaning the general surroundings, things that don't need to cost a lot of money and uh, still have a big impact. But how would you in your, so if you were in a facility, how would you think about um, uh, prioritizing what, what improvements are needed? So we know that facilities are all resource constrained, both in financial resources and in time constraints. And what WASHFIT helps you to do is to get an overall picture of where the problems are in the healthcare facilities. And think about where to start. I think often it can feel overwhelming if you say in that picture, those pictures that we saw before, looking at that situation, it looks like uh, you know, it's a very difficult situation, but how can you um, use the results of your assessment to um, decide what are the things that need to be done first? So what are the things that have the biggest risk from maybe an infection point of view, or uh, what are the things that prevent people from coming into the facility? In this sample facility, um, we, through the course of the assessment, the team has identified a number of problems. So there are frequent water source shortages uh, due to, which is increasing due to climate change and variability. Drinking water isn't treated. The toilets are not clearly segregated for male and female. The light bulbs are broken and the electricity is unreliable. Waste is not correctly segregated at the point of generation. So there's a number of problems that have been identified. Your resources are limited and you cannot make all of the improvements that are needed immediately. So what, what criteria would you use to prioritize? And this will be different in every, every setting. You may wish to prioritize based on um, what are the quick, the quick wins, the low hanging fruit, things that can be done immediately. Or you may be feeling ambitious and you want to tackle the really big complicated things like the water shortage. And there's no right way of doing it, but as a team, the idea is that you review your um, assessment the results of your assessment together, the problems that have been identified, and come up with a way of prioritizing which ones will be uh, tackled first and which ones will be tackled later down the line. So I wanted to show one example, a simple way that this has been done in Indonesia. So this is in a small, fairly um, remote district hospital, uh, again, with very limited resources. So. Each of those yellow pieces of paper you see there are problems that were identified and improvements that were needed. So the staff wrote them all down on those strips of paper. And as a team together, they ranked them according to how um, the, the level of the risk and how much they felt that they should prioritize an improvement. And you can see there on the right hand side, that's how they came up with a, a ladder uh, from 
the things that should be uh, addressed immediately and then ones that will be tackled later down the line. And what did that look like in, pr in practice? Well, one of the main things that they had identified was problems with their waste management, both from the healthcare waste side, but also um, just general waste that patients were throwing out of the window in the nutrition clinic. So they decided that this was something that they could tackle with very little money. So they set up a cleaning campaign for one month and installed some bins uh, in the ground. You can see there's a very um, low cost bin that, uh, that was installed there. And through the process of this um, month long cleaning campaign, the general environment of the healthcare facility was significantly improved, which had lowered the risk of infection um, and injury. So that's a, an example of, of low cost solutions that can be made uh, where the team has come together, assessed the risk, decided what can be done, and then put it into action. So you've decided what your um, the main problems are and what actions need to be taken. So then the facility, the WashFit team, um, pull this together and develop the improvement plan, and importantly, take action. So you have this, the long list, all the improvements that you have identified that are needed. Then, the, then you prioritize which one uh, should be done uh, immediately. That would be the short list. Then you need to decide when and who will complete these actions, what resources are needed, and they may be technical resources, it may be human resources, so time commitment, or of course, they may be financial. And Quite likely, you may also need to bring in external support. So it might be somebody from the district health office. It might be somebody who's got specific expertise in climate um, adaptations in a healthcare facility. It might be a member of the community, um, an engineer. So don't, it doesn't always have to be just the facility that tackles these problems. You can bring in um, external expertise. So. The improvements, they could be lots of different things. It could be about building new infrastructure, though of course that's often very, uh, can be expensive and beyond the, the budget of a facility. It could be simple, like repairing old infrastructure, fixing taps, leaky pipes. Um, it may be more complicated considering uh, climate variability, clearing away broken equipment, reviewing protocols and SOPs, um, also to include more on climate resilience, staff training in new techniques or procedures, improving management methods, but importantly, thinking about simple low cost improvements that can still have a big impact. And perhaps imagination and creativity is also needed as was shown, for example, from that Indonesia, um, Indonesian facility. It would, I'm conscious again of time, so rushing somewhat to the uh, last slide, but again, just wanted to show you a few pictures where WASPIT has been um, implemented. This was from a facility in Chad, um, so this is in a, an extremely low resource setting. Some creative um, improvements that were done with very little money. So the first one, planting plants by the health facility entrance. Uh, in the middle there, some clear signs demonstrating gender separation of the dream and hand uh, drawing a poster for um, to educate about hand washing. Uh, and that was done by the head of the healthcare facility. Again, with very little money, uh, these are simple solutions that can be done by the facility themselves. The slightly higher income setting, um, washed it in Tajikistan, I mentioned in that um, maternity, uh, maternity department of a hospital. Water tanks with lids and taps accessible to patients when there was no, previously no drinking water available. Um, the sanitation facilities were adapted to patients with physical impairment, and there were again, hand washing posters um, put up in key locations. An example from Kenya about um, how to assign the responsibility. So, who is going to be in charge of implementing these improvements that have been, been um, identified? So, in Kenya, they found that there were certain elements of the healthcare facility that 
should be the response. Different, different groups have responsibility for improving. So some were actually above the hospital management and required external support, either from the county or the district level. Some they delegated to specific persons or groups within the hospital. And the team in Kenya, they went through their wash fit assessment. And for every single indicator, they agreed as a team who should be assigned responsibility. And they divided those up into the three levels. So 14% of the indicators they decided were the county level. So for example, looking at um, the water quality standards, the availability of piped water supply because they were connected to a municipal water supply. 48%, so almost half, were specifically the responsibility of the hospital management, but with help from the, the, the country government. So looking at having adequate cleaners and staff, um, appropriate water treatment and storage and available and useful toilets. And then 38% specifically um, for the IPC committee to take responsibility for, so waste segregation and hand hygiene. So again, just showing that there's different ways of doing this uh, in different facilities, different um, settings, and there's many ways that you can adapt it um, for each of those places. Okay, step five, so reflect, adapt, improve, and learn. It's recommended to conduct the wash fit assessment every six months and calculate the wash fit score at the end of it. Every six months, recalculate the score, so re conduct the assessment again, recalculate the score, and see how has it changed since the last assessment, which domains have improved, which is scoring less well, and importantly, why. And again, do you need to ask for external help? I said then we would come back to uh, the, the team at the end. So the wash fit, who, who's responsible um, for wash fit? In many facilities, um, there may be an IPC committee or a quality improvement committee. And the wash fit, it doesn't need to be a specific new wash fit team that's formed. It can be an existing committee or management structure that also takes on some of these um, the tasks of wash fit. Those teams may meet already meet weekly or monthly, and so that would provide an opportunity to talk about uh, the wash fit assessment, the results, the improvements, where further improvements are needed, what's working, what's not working, and what can be improved. The team will vary vary according to the size of the facility. So in a rural healthcare centre, there's one, um, these two pictures are from Bhutan, um, where there's one nurse and one health assistant. They're not going to have a very extensive wash fit team with lots and lots of people. So they add a, a small number of indicators that sort of the, the number that the nurse and the healthcare assistant felt that they were able to um, assess regularly and monitor. In a bigger facility, so a district hospital, it may have, might have more people. So there may be a nurse, a doctor, an IPC focal point, a person that deals with the healthcare waste management, a member of the committee. Uh, so it might be a much bigger team. And the WashFit guide uh, provides some more information about uh, the types of expertise that you may want to involve in the team. So I won't go into it in lots of detail now, but the main thing to think about is that it doesn't have to be completely new structure that's formed to deal with wash fit. It can be something that's integrated into the existing processes within a healthcare facility. I think this is uh, the last slide. So just to, to focus on management and leadership. So leadership is really important to drive and to sustain change. So this is an example from a district hospital in Ethiopia, which had a very strong culture of quality improvement and used um, the, the wash fit process to, to drive change. So they had a committed leader, they had staff who were incentivized with awards for good performance, they had a formally recognized quality management system, uh, regular audits of wash and IPC, uh, and then wards were ranked according to their wash fit score and shown at the facility entrance. So again, there was this uh, incentive to make sure that services were met well maintained, improvements continued, and that they continued to score well. 
Okay, that brings me to the end um, of the, the presentation. I'm sorry, I, I'm very conscious that I've been talking for a long time um, and I've only really, really just touched on the surface of wash fit and the methodology. But um, with that, I think I'll hand, I believe Maggie is on the line. You're able to- Yes, Arabella, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So okay. I'll, I'll pass to you, Maggie, for um, the next part. Okay. Fantastic. So thank um, hopefully for many of you, this wasn't necessarily new, but hopefully that you, you were able to grab some new insights um, about the specific element. Um, I was going to give a very quick presentation on water. We did develop, as Arabella mentioned, um, five technical modules that go into a lot of the details about what the standards are, how they can be implemented. Um, but wanted just to give you a teaser today. But before I do that, I just want to see if there's any questions or clarifications um, about the presentation Arabella just gave. And let me see. I can't see my chat. Okay, I'm opening this. Um, so yes, if you could type them in the chat, I think that would be the easiest. I see we have. Um, a, a comment from Alex, and maybe Arabella, you want to respond to this about how low cost short term activities may look attractive, they may, but might not have a lasting effect. Um, he also is talking about the importance of bringing in the district officers um, and, the and the municipality and, and the community. So I don't know if everybody, you want to touch on any of those things right now. And if anybody else has any questions, please type them. Um, otherwise, we'll continue with water. So o over to you, Arabella, first. Okay. Thanks, Maggie. And thanks, Alex, for that comment. And perhaps there's others on this call who have direct experience maybe of making such improvements um, and would like to share their, their feedback here. I think all improvements are um, important and all of them need ongoing maintenance in order to sustain them. So any improvement I think that, that is made has the potential in six months, in a year, if not um, directly continued or without, if there's no leadership to, to do it or there's not sufficient budget, um, there's a potential for that improvement to uh, to go back to how it was uh, before. I think bringing in the district officers are very important um, and the facility. I think in we had one example, and I'm, I apologize, I forget which country it was now, uh, that said that bringing in the community is, is a no-brainer. The community is already legally required to be uh, a part of the facility committee. So uh, nothing can happen without the committee. And I think there's many countries as well where even if it's not um, legally binding, uh, the community still be, play a big part. So having a community voice that can uh, drive change, uh, provide feedback if uh, maybe things of standards have, have fallen after initial improvements were made, I think is, is very important. Um, but I think with all of these, the focus has to be on action, however big, however small, and sustained effort to uh, maintain that action over time. Super, thanks, Arabella. And hopefully, um, when we hear from Philippines, they can maybe try to touch on some of these elements too about engaging the district, about what it means to actually engage the communities as well. So please keep that in mind. Okay, so without further delay, I'm going to quickly go through a few slides on water. I don't know if I can, no, I don't think I can switch the slides, but maybe you can give me control, perfect. Okay, so water. Um, we decided to choose water because it seems to be um, one of the services that can fundamentally change um, what a facility looks like, how all the other wash elements um, are addressed. It's, obviously um, very important, but also it, there's a very kind of visual aspect to it. So we have a number of learning objectives, and if we were going through the whole thing, we'd want you to know all of these, but I'm just going to touch um, on a few and especially try to focus more on the water quality aspect. 
Um, so we have a few photos here, and it's really meant for you to maybe pause for a second and see what are some of the problems linked to inadequate water supply in healthcare facilities. So if you could just rapidly uh, type in the chat um, what you think some of the problems are, that would be fantastic. The prize will be like a, a emoji smiley face because we're not with you, but otherwise we would um, have real prizes for you. Okay. I'm going to move on, but hopefully you're you're still thinking. So there's obviously a number of issues. There's the lack of 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 water, and that can lead to dehydration, the in, inability to, to to actually consume medicines. Obviously, contaminated water is a, is a problem not only um, for diarrhea but other waterborne outbreaks such as Legionella. We need water for hand hygiene, and especially during giving. Uh, during the birthing process, hand, uh, hand rub will not be sufficient um, because hands often get very visibly soiled. Um, and we also need water for cleaning, for showers, for toilets, and all of these things are, are really important. Um, great, appreciate the, from Dr. Meitan Halang, appreciate your comments about infection and also in rural areas, and it's true, we, we often have bigger challenges um, in rural areas. But the good news is there are solutions, and we're seeing solutions being implemented in many places. Um, on the left, you see just a simple drinking water station, and these can be used in places where you don't have pipe supplies, but you can carry water from a source, treat it, um, and then put it in these stations to make sure that patients have water to drink. There's all kinds of water treatment um, technologies that are out there, WHO regularly tests the performance of them. Right now we have a list of 30 that we've tested, so we um, encourage you to take a look at that list. Uh, five of them do not work, and those are products on the market. So don't assume because a product is being sold that it actually is going to protect uh, your water. We've also seen a lot of solar being put in, and um, it's being done in areas that don't have regular power and have lots of sun. So it's it, it's um it's a really practical solution, and as the price of the panels goes down and the capability of the batteries goes up, it, it becomes um, an easier technology to sustain over time. Um, and elevated tanks obviously are nice because you don't need to then pump water afterwards through the system. And then lastly, uh, rainwater catchment, which can be useful in areas where there's regular rainfall, and I know many countries um, in Asia have this situation, and Vietnam in particular has been putting in some rainwater, so maybe we can hear from them. Um, so the next slide, these are just some illustrations, so I won't go into detail, but these were extracted um, from a new forthcoming compendium of water technology is at AVAG, which is a WHO collaborating center, has developed. So if you want to know all the engineering specifics for all you engineering nerds out there, um, they're all available. But climate, what is the impact of, of climate on water supply? And we had a really great presentation yesterday from Carlos and Elena to give us the overall framework. Um, and many of these issues were mentioned. So, you know, there's obviously issues around flooding and how that can um, not only affect the quality of the surface water in particular, but as well as the groundwater, but also it can damage infrastructure. So it can damage wells, it can damage piping, um, and this then requires um, thinking and not only in how they can be repaired, but how such infrastructure can be rebuilt, or if it's the first time it's being put in, being put in such a way that it's more resilient. So raising wells um, so the infrastructure doesn't become as damaged, making sure you have a secondary water source um, in case your primary one um, uh, becomes unusable are, are, are two kind of practical ways that some of these water supply issues um, can be overcome. So on the opposite of flooding, we also have droughts, and um, droughts also are very problematic because all of a sudden you have less water. Um, higher temperatures we know can, can increase uh, cyanobacteria blooms, which increase toxins um, in the water, which requires then obviously treatment, but potentially 
different ways of treating the water that, that are normally um, treated. Um, and in general, I think that this, this um, issue of drought requires obviously use of water in a really efficient way, but again, additional water storage. So when the normal water supplies become low, there's um, an alternative. Okay, so WHO has lots of guidelines on water, and actually our guidelines on drinking water are the oldest ones. They actually predate WHO itself. So I think the first um, guideline was published in 1956. I hope all of you are familiar with the water sector safety planning approach because it, it's been used in the Asia region for quite a long time now, and it's what we use um, as an inspiration for the WASH FIT. Um, there's new guidance now on water safety planning and climate, so how you can mainstream some of those climate resilience um, considerations um, into your planning. Um, just quickly on the regulation side, this is also really important because we would expect and we would hope that the water quality in the healthcare facilities would be regulated by the authorities and often those are based in the Ministry of Health. And so um, understanding what regulations are in place understanding what monitoring is occurring, I think is really important um, for being able to not only improve your water quality, but um, engage other authorities, potentially outside those that are managing the facility themselves. Um, and then lastly, I already mentioned the water treatment performance testing that we do, and of course, the essential environmental health standards, which um, I'm hoping many of you are familiar with. I just wanted to to clarify one point, because Alex brought it up after the webinar yesterday, is that the, the global indicators for basic water, for example, in healthcare facilities, look at some of the standards, but not all. So from our perspective, basic water is far from sufficient for your minimum standards, because basic water doesn't look at water quality, it doesn't look at water sufficiency, it doesn't look at water for some of these other uses like showers. So really we would encourage, and it is reflected in Wash Fit to refer to the standards um, in that green book. Oops, oh no, oh, sorry, now I'm going the wrong way. Okay, bear with me. Um, okay, what are the main needs related to standards? Well, it kind of just covered these already, but again, these are the standards that are in that green book. I won't go into a lot of um, detail, but I think uh, it's important to understand what is the ideal, what is currently in your country, and what are incremental ways to, to improve and try to meet those standards. Um, so I mentioned that I was gonna focus in on water quality. I think it's really important and it's something that when we first launched WashFit, we didn't put as much focus on. Um, Obviously, for the drinking water, it's really important that there isn't any fecal contamination um, and or other chemical contaminants that are of high concern in your country, but also that there's a chlorine residual. And, you know, this is important to maintain the integrity of the water and, and present, prevent um, future contamination. It, drinking water obviously needs to be safely stored in a clean bucket. And there needs to be uh, energy available for pumping and or treating water. We put boiling here, but increasingly we're seeing more sophisticated water treatment um, standalone modules that uh, use nanofiltration that requires um, pumping. And, and lastly, just to highlight the importance of a shower in a bathing area, and that's particularly important in the birthing center, in, in the birthing setting. Okay, microbiology, this is really exciting. We started talking about germs, but um, just to highlight, there's three main pathogens of concern when we're talking about uh, waterborne diarrhea, viruses, bacteria, protozoan. Legionella is the bacterium that is increasingly becoming of concern in healthcare facilities. There's more Legionella being detected in individuals and more outbreaks. And the, the thinking is this is because, first of all, we're actually testing for it. So when someone comes in with pneumonia-like conditions, they're tested for Legionella. But also, um, 
hospitals who are trying to save energy and be green by lowering their hot water temperature and also reducing water flow through more um, water efficient devices are creating a potential uh, ideal uh, breeding ground for, for Legionella. So I think that this point is really important to emphasize is that when you're thinking about greening and climate approaches, you also need to consider the potential side effects and Legionella is certainly one of them. So don't lower your hot water temperature too much and make sure you keep having flow in your, in your pipes because dead end and, and, and low flow in, in plumbing um, are, are two factors that can lead to Legionella growth. Um, just wanted to quickly hi highlight COVID-19. I gave a webinar yesterday afternoon to the WASH cluster talking about the latest technical brief that WHO and UNICEF have developed, which largely focuses on healthcare facilities and largely um, just re-emphasizes our existing um, standards because for COVID, you don't need to do anything different. You just need to make sure that you're implementing um, the existing standards around having water that is treated um, and making sure that you take the hygiene and cleaning techniques. Um, this virus, because it's enveloped, it's more sensitive to oxidants, especially chlorine. And finally, just to mention, there is no known fecal oral route. So, uh, I'm going, oops, did I skip a slide? Sorry. Okay, next slide. As I mentioned, water treatment, make sure you check to see if whatever treatment um, technology you're putting in, first of all, check to see if it's been tested by WHO and see where it falls. If it hasn't, you need to really demand that the manufacturer give some evidence that it is effective in removing the pathogens that we're most concerned about. For general practices um, and where the key pathogen of concern is not known, we really recommend comprehensive protection. So this is three or two stars. So these are devices that remove all three types of pathogens I just mentioned. You can see a lot of devices are falling in this targeted protection. So these are ones that only remove two of the three pathogen groups. Um, so you need to uh, be careful with some of these because you may not be getting the full protection that you're aiming for. And obviously those that have little or no protection, don't buy them. So that's our advice. Um, okay, so I'm almost to the end and very conscious again of time and really look forward to hearing from Philippines. Uh, there's lots of ways to understand risks associated with water quality. And, you know, often we see that people jump to step four, conduct fecal indicator bacteria testing, because it's fun. You get to play around with little tools and, you know, you, you feel like you're doing something. But there's many things that you can do before you start doing that testing that often are easier, are cheaper. Um, and, you know, give you right away input on whether or not there's risk to your water quality. So the sanitation inspection forms, and these are included in the WASH FIT. They're currently being updated by both our sanitation and water team here at WHO. So we'll be having new and improved forms, but those give a really good immediate sense of what risks are. As I already mentioned, regulatory data is, is, is important and useful, and it can give some insights into quality. Simply checking for the chlorine residual. If you have a residual in your water supply, it's highly unlikely that you have fecal contamination. So that's a really good check. And finally, as, as recommended through the water safety plan approach, if you put in water quality improvements, then you can use the fecal indicator bacteria testing to see if those improvements have actually worked. Okay. so. I'm going to end here. I think the key things to remember is that obviously water is fundamental and it's not just about preventing infection, which is a very important aspect, but it's also about dignity of patients, of caregivers, having them have a clean environment, environment where they can um, drink water if they need to, where they can use a shower when they need to. Um, and when possible, water should really be treated. That 
we, we know that globally from the household surveys, we have 2 billion people drinking contaminated water. So in the healthcare facility where people are more vulnerable and potentially could more easily become sick, it's really important it's treated. Um, and then lastly, just to highlight that climate resilience for water is, is really important. And there are some very simple ways in terms of having backup supplies and in terms of building infrastructure that's stronger, that's slightly higher, um, are ways that it can be uh, uh, improved to, to, to make it more climate resilient. So with that, I'll take any questions. Um, okay, I see some in the chat box, so maybe um, I will quickly try to address those. So, Bonnie, traditional chlorination may not be effective for protozoan cysts. Exactly, Bonnie, that's why chlorine falls in our one star category. It does not remove cysts. So um, if you do think there's potential to have cysts in the water supply, it should be filtered first and then chlorinated. The good thing about the cysts is they're bigger, so they're um, easier to remove by filtration than some of our other pathogens. But yes, that's a very good point. Um, we have from Indonesia, for unpiped water supply, what are the suggested parameters? Yeah, so for the unpiped water supply, um, first, I would recommend doing the sanitary inspection form to see if there's, you know, do you have any, if it's, if it's um, from a dug well, right? Is the well protected? Is it sealed? Do you have any animals nearby? Um, what kind of data is there on the quality? Typically, when wells are initially dug and commissioned, they should do some water quality testing, so at least you could see at the very beginning you know, was there any contamination? And if you just, if you go through all of that and you find the list risks are really low, I wouldn't suggest that you necessarily need to do any testing. But I do suggest that um, you should do some kind of chlorination because, as we all know, even if the water is clean at the source, it can easily become contaminated through carrying and storage, um, which often happens from dug wells because there's so much handling that has to happen. Okay. I don't see anything else and appreciate the comment about rural areas. And I think that in rural areas, we really need to be creative about water supplies. So for example, if we're putting in a water supply in a community, why can't that supply also serve the healthcare facility or vice versa? We've seen that a lot in Africa where there can be sharing of investments and sharing of water supplies. I think potentially rainwater harvesting um, can be a solution, but I know it really depends on the rainfall um, in in the areas. But yeah, appreciate appreciate that comment. Okay, I am now going to hand it over to I think it's Bonnie who's presenting from the Philippines to give us a little bit of insights about how they've used wash fit what what's been successful, what the challenges are. So if we could switch to those slides. And Bonnie, are you, are you? Yes, I'm Maggie. Actually, okay. I have no slides to, to okay, show. Fine. Just okay. discuss uh, the steps that we have done in the Philippines uh, quickly. Perfect. But that um, give an idea on uh, what we are doing here. That's good for for you. Yeah, that's great. Go ahead, go All ahead, right. and, and and while Bonnie's talking, if you have questions, please do type them in the chat. All right. Thank you, Maggie, and good afternoon, everyone. I'll be sharing with you the process on adopting the wash fit tool in the Philippines. This is done through the participation of WIPRO, WHO country office in the Philippines, Department of Health, the local government units selected primary healthcare facilities and the community health workers in the, in the areas that we tested this. So we have four major activities related to this. One is the pre-testing of wash fit assessment tool in one municipality for three healthcare facilities. That was done in, in March, uh, last March 2019, last year. And then after that, we conducted pilot testing of this adopted wash fit assessment tool in six healthcare facilities located in three project areas. So that's outside of the pre-testing area. 
from April to September last year also. And this year, we'll be conducting capacity building for wash feet to come up with master trainers. We are targeting at least five master trainers and to develop Philippine training materials for wash feet. And uh, for next year and to the end of the project, we'll be aiming to develop a policy on how to use wash feet at the national level. So to start with, uh, with uh, um, maybe I'll just discuss the pre-testing first. Um, the objective of the pre-testing is to determine if the Philippine terminologies, concepts, and standards are reflected or can be reflected in the questionnaires or in the uh, wash pit assessment tool. And based on our uh, pre-testing, yes, uh, there, are, there are terminologies that uh, have to, ch to be changed and Philippine terminologies to be uh, um, uh, introduced. Uh, the Philippine training materials is in English uh, because it's tested in Metro Manila area, near Metro Manila. And we are planning to translate it to local versions depending on the region, sub-national regions in the country in the, during the project uh, stage. This, by the way, this project is supported by DFAT and uh, the target end of the project is by 2022. And hopefully by that time, we already completed our relevant to this. So um, this uh, wash fit assessment tool can be completed uh, within two hours uh, based on our testing in three healthcare facilities. And the participants could be the community health workers who could do the assessment. Uh, we just train them and then after that they do the assessment. So um, uh, on the question on participation of the community, community health workers can do the assessment by themselves by simplifying the terminologies. And uh, one uh, example for uh, introducing Philippine terminologies in this question on, for example, water is treated and collected for treating with proven technology that meets WHO performance standards. So we change WHO performance standards and instead introduce uh, Philippine national standards for drinking water. Because that's the standards that we are using here and not the WHO standards. In addition, also, uh, drinking water has a proprietary residual of 0.2 milligrams per liter and zero E. coli. In the Philippine context, we change that. Uh, instead of uh, 0.2, we change it to 0.3 milligrams per liter. And for E. coli, it's one less one E. coli per 100 ml, not zero. So the, because that's the parameters included in our national standards for drinking water. So overall uh, findings for this and feedback from the local government unit is that WASFIT is really a very useful tool in finding current status of the uh, wash in healthcare facilities and uh, the rating in terms of percentage of uh, wash facilities can be easily measured. The items for improvement can be identified and the cost can be estimated and including the time frame for improvement, it can also be included in the plan. So the local government units are very happy for it. And instead of, you know, instead of requesting funds for WHO uh, for the improvement, after their findings, they said they can find it from their own funds. And they are requesting that the funds are intended for them to be used for other healthcare facilities that will be needing. So they are really appreciating this tool. And we are also happy with that. And after the pre-testing, we introduced that to the pilot areas, which is different from the pre-testing areas. And in the pilot sites, we have three, three areas where six facilities are located. The purpose of uh, pilot testing is to determine if the pre-tested assessment tool is applicable also in pilot areas which are located in different parts of the country. We have in the, in the Luzon on uh, northern part, central part, and southern part of the Philippines to check uh, using different cultures, different contexts, if this tool can be used. Based on our findings, yes, this can be used, different contexts, different culture. However, um, we need to reduce the number of indicators, considering that some of them are not applicable in their context. For example, one question in item 1.12 in water, 
the, uh, the question is, energy is available for heating water. So we deleted this because in some culture, they are not using heating or water in healthcare facilities setting. So they will reduce some indicators and uh, uh, so as to facilitate uh, the filling up of the forms. Um, overall, uh, what the findings for the pilot testing will still be fine-tuned in the development of training materials, which we'll be doing this uh, year. We'll be starting actually, we just hired uh, a contractor to do that starting this month up to July. And um, uh, the development of training materials uh, will be done in the three areas, pilot areas that I've mentioned, and also in uh, six healthcare facilities. The six healthcare facilities involve two hospitals, um, one rural 